Welcome everyone to Real Life Online. Thank you for joining us today. Real Life is a church for real people just like you, and we want you to know that God is crazy about you. Please take a moment right now and click on the share button and share this experience with your friends and family. This weekend, we are so excited to welcome Dave Ramsey to Real Life as we continue in our year of freedom. Dave is an expert on managing money and teaching biblical principles to help people gain control over their finances. One of the biggest areas that people struggle with is managing their money, so this is going to be a very important message we all need to hear. Thank you again for tuning in today. Let's get ready for Real Life Online. What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? This is my family's legacy that I'm talking about here. I've got to have a plan and be focused. That knowledge that you pass down to your kids, that is how you change a family tree. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you have that moment where you say, I've had it. I'm not going to live like this anymore. Woo, good to see everyone today. Love you guys. Welcome to our locations all around Central Florida in week two of the Year of Freedom. And we, uh, we have to admit that one of the biggest obstacles to freedom in our lives is money, right? Personal finance, especially when it's going bad, it messes up a lot of things. We happen to have been graced by God to have the best guy in the world to talk to us about that. So Brother Dave Ramsey's in the house. We're gonna keep giving you love, bro, because you're amazing. And you've set a lot of people free by God's uh, design and call for your life. Here's what, so the first time Dave and I got to spend time together, we were at dinner together. And he was with his wife, Sharon. And uh, just the conversation, here's what, you know when you're with somebody and they're real. And what really struck me about Dave is, first of all, Dave Ramsey doesn't have to do anything. Right, he's been following his principles for a long time, haven't you? <laughs> you're doing okay. Dave Ramsey doesn't have to do anything. He does not have to fly to Florida and speak to a church. He does it because it's his passion, it's his calling, and because he cares deeply about helping people find financial peace, helping people find freedom. And so that's why he's here, guys, is because he loves the Lord, he loves us, and he wants to help us find that peace. So will you please help me welcome my brother, Dave Ramsey. Thank you, man. Thank you, brother. Love that guy. Gotten to know Pastor Justin over the last couple of years. We have the top 50 pastors of top 50 churches in America come into Nashville at our expense and just love on them and get to know them and become friends with them a couple times. I guess we've done it for about four or five years, and he's been at most of those, and I've gotten to know him. We've become good friends. He's just an incredible guy. Y'all give him a round of applause. So pastor calls me up and he said, Dave, uh, do you believe in free speech? And I said, yeah. And he said, good, I want you to give one. <laughs> That's just the kind of guy he is, I'm just saying. So. Let's pray. God, you know I can do these talks by myself. They sure are better when you do them. Turn this time over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So my wife and I got married 38 years ago. We were stupid. <laughs> we didn't know anything. Just a couple of hillbilly rednecks getting married. You didn't, you didn't go through pre-marriage counseling. You just get hitched, you know, and hope it works out. So bless her heart, she didn't marry well. Um, <laughs> It was a mess. And uh, we were broke, too. Y'all remember when you started out? We ain't got money, honey, but we got love. <laughs> we started off broke. And we moved to Nashville, where I was from originally. We met her in Knoxville. I was going to the University of Tennessee back when they used to play football. And um, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we, we get married, and we moved to Nashville in a little one-bedroom apartment, eating off a card table. And 
After about two weeks of marriage, she gets up on a Sunday morning and says, announces, well, actually what happened was she remembered she was a Baptist. <clears throat> She'd forgotten to tell me this. Uh, we hadn't had any discussions about Baptists or Jesus or God or anything like that. We just got married. And um, she gets up on Sunday morning and announces we're going to church. I said, we aren't doing anything. It's Sunday morning. I'm not going to church. I'll be drinking beer and watching football. This is what you do on Sunday morning. What's wrong with you, woman? Well, we're in Nashville, which is the buckle of the Bible belt, right? There's more Baptists there than people. <laughs> and so she gets all mad and tore up and has a crying fit because I won't go to church with her, and I'm not going to church. So she heads out. Of course, it didn't take her long to find her tribe, so found a little Baptist church and went in there and goes to church and her and those little Baptist people prayed for her heathen husband. And um, this went on for four, five, six months, the first six months of our marriage. And every Sunday we'd repeat this scene. She'd cry, have a fit, drive off, find a Baptist. and uh, It wasn't going well, y'all. It just wasn't going well. And I got in one of these uh, multi-level things where you get rich and make all your friends mad. Y'all know those things? And so... I was going to get a yacht and have a big house, and I was going to be a big deal and all this stuff. And one of my beer-drinking buddies got me into this thing. There's a lot of beer in this story. But um, anyway, we, he, me and him were so dumb. It was Daryl and his other brother, Daryl, trying to do business, right? <laughs> we would go to happy hour and then go make sales calls and couldn't figure out why we couldn't make sales. This is how dumb we were, all right? So... Anyway, we decided the business wasn't going well. We needed to learn how to do it right. And so there was one of the big pep rallies down in Birmingham, Alabama, at the Alabama Theater. And so we get in the car and drive two hours south from Nashville down to Birmingham and, and go into the Alabama Theater, which in my mind, I saw 10,000 people in there. You ever go back to your elementary school and it has shrunk? <laughs> yeah, the Alabama Theater, we used it for an event not long ago, holds 800 people. But in my mind, it was 10, it's a cute little theater, but it's, you know, Small, and so in my mind, there's 10,000 people because me and Daryl, we were sitting on the back row of the balcony. You know, we were way back there, not picking on the balcony people, but this was us back then. And so, I mean, the guy that got up at the end of the day was the dog. He was the big dog. He was the one making all the money. He was who we wanted to be. He had the yacht. I mean, he holds up a check, $400,000. That's what he's making every 10 minutes or whatever, you know. You know how they do that stuff, right? Hype city. And so he's going on and on. And we had written down five or six things that if we could learn these five or six things, we could make it in the business. We'd be able to get the big house, get the big yacht, live the dream, all that stuff, right? And so this guy gets up. Not only did he have credibility with us because he was the guy we wanted to be, but then it was as if he had our five or six things as the outline for his talk. And he walked right down and read our mail. And he was a wonderful speaker. He was a great orator. And by the time he finished talking, to say that he owned us was an understatement. Anything he told us to do, he, we were going to do. And he gets to the end of his talk, and he said, and there's one more thing. And we went, I don't know. I think I got it. One more thing. If you don't know God, you're going to struggle in business. Because when you meet Jesus, his son, you learn that relationships are more important than transactions. And business people who don't understand that people are more important than transactions don't do well in business long term. You need to know God. And I looked at my buddy and I went, has he been talking to my wife? <laughs> so we go back home. No, actually, we went back to the Holiday Inn and got the Gideon's Bible out of the nightstand, right? And of course, it's King James. Shakespeare and Jesus. I mean, the chances of these two rednecks getting through this is zero, all right? So we closed that up anyway. We go home. I told my wife, I said, we're going to church. And she's like, who are you and what have you done with my husband? And so we visited some churches. We found some of those churches where they're not having fun. This I do not understand. How you can know God and not be having fun? I mean, some of these people look like they were weaned on a pickle. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They were not having fun. Finally, we go in this little church, about 400 people, and they were having a blast, and we're sitting on the back row, because, you know, when you're checking churches out, you sit on the back row so you can exit quick. You know, you, you score a card, and I'm out of here, right? And so we're on the back row, and this woman in the choir starts swaying. 
And then she raised her hand like she knew the answer to some question. I had never seen anybody raise their hand in church. I'd never heard of this stuff. And, and, and then another one raised their hand. Then everybody started raising their hands. I told Sharon, if they get snakes out, I am out of here. <laughs> Old school church, the pastor would stand at the back, little church, three, 400 people on Sunday morning. He and his wife would stand at the back and shake your hand, you know, everybody as they leave, the old school. It's a long time ago. It's 40, almost 40 years ago. And uh, she's a big squishy woman. She'd give you a big grandma hug, you know, and he, he'd give you a good man handshake. And he was a man. He wasn't a wuss. I thought Christians were wimps. And, and he, he would say stuff like, this is what it says in the Bible. And if you don't agree with that, you're what's known as wrong. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> I like that. Take a stand, you know. Be something. This nye, 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 try to make everybody happy doesn't work, right? Just this is what it is and deal with it. Oh, I love that. And that guy's strength and that lady's grace and her wonderful grandma hugs hugged us into the kingdom and I met God in that church in a very real way. And I didn't know beans, y'all. I mean, I didn't know anything about how to do anything. I mean, the preacher would be saying, and you know when Joseph's brothers threw Joseph in the hole? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> don't know Joseph, don't know the brothers, don't know the hole. <laughs> but before I go to bed tonight, I will. And I will, and I will. And I began to dive in and learn scriptures because I had some catching up to do. That was a long time ago, so I've certainly done more than my share of study since then. The weird thing was is that as we were meeting God, I started buying and selling real estate. I left that, that other thing, and we got rich. I ended up with 26 years old. I had $4 million worth of real estate, a little over a million dollar net worth, and I was making $200,000 a month, $200,000 a year, $20,000 a month, which in the neighborhood I grew up in, we called that rich. I don't know where you're from, but that was, that was 1986, 1984. Unbelievable. We were having a blast. It was fun too, y'all. I mean, I got that car I always wanted. You got that car you always wanted? I wanted a Jaguar, man, because nobody in my old neighborhood could even spell Jaguar, right? <laughs> Much less knew what one cost because this was really cool, right? That got me a Jaguar, man. Pretty soon I was a Jaguar. It's like, you know, <laughs> right? We were having fun. We got sharing some of those sparkly things. They weren't big enough, so we got her some more. And we went to Hawaii, rednecks in Hawaii. Oh, my. It's like, it's like Gomer Pyle seeing that blue water. It's like, wow. You know, it's like, and we loved it. So you know what we did? We went back. It was fun. Sometimes I hear these people say, all those rich people are miserable. Uh-uh. <laughs> now, I'm not here to tell you money will make you happy. Money will not make you happy. Money will make you more of what you already are. It magnifies the good in you and it magnifies the bad in you when you get it. People who are jerks and get money, they become world-class jerks. People who are unbelievable fanatics about integrity and honesty, when they get money, you can't move them off of anything. They stay with the truth. People that are givers, when they get money, they impact communities, cities, the world. We call them philanthropists. When you get money, you become more of what you are. If you're depressed and you get money, you will, be, you will go into a deep place of depression. Money will not heal you. Jesus will heal you. But money will not heal you. Money will not make you better. It'll make you more. And that includes the crazy in your life. Like the crazy in your family. And everybody's got crazy in their family. If you don't think you got crazy in your family, that means it's you. <laughs> everybody's got crazy. It gets crazier, right? It gets wilder. So I, everything's going good, you guys. Have, but I had done some stupid stuff. How many of y'all ever did something stupid with money? Raise your hand. How many of you didn't raise your hand have a problem with lying? 
If you're in here and you're over 12, you've made mistakes with money. Now, maybe you didn't do them as big and dumb as I did. I did it with zeros on the end. I have a PhD in D-U-M-B. So we were borrowing money like crazy because I was buying houses and flipping them before there was cable TV to do this. Chip and Joanna hadn't been born yet. And so we're fixing houses and fixing them up, and we're buying properties and rental properties. And we, that's what the wealth was coming from. I was doing real estate deals, right? And I had a lot of 90-day notes because I was doing short-term deals, and our bank got sold to another bank. I know that never happens in Florida. And um, some guy in another state looks down and says, there's a kid, 26 years old, owes us a million two. He goes, let's limit this relationship. This is scary, which is banker talk for ruin his life. We were not late on the notes, but they freaked out and on quality collateral, what you can do on commercial paper, a little detail there, but they called our notes and we got in trouble. We'd never been late. We lost money on a couple deals, but we covered those because we were making money. We were just, we were cooking, man. And uh, another, another bank called our notes because rumor got out I was in trouble. And we spent the next two and a half years of our life losing everything we owned. We were sued. <laughs> We were sued so much <laughs> that the guy with the sheriff's department that brings the little lawsuit papers, we're like best friends. <laughs> Sharon's like, come on in, Harold, I'm making cookies. You know what I mean? It's just ridiculous, right? And, and, and we were foreclosed on and with a brand new baby and a toddler and a marriage hanging on by a thread, finally we were bankrupt. We didn't get a divorce. We held on to each other, but sometimes it's just to get a better grip. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Sharon's from the hills of East Tennessee. Frying pan throwing there is an Olympic event. <laughs> Don't mess with a hillbilly woman. That's all I'm saying. Whew. It wasn't fun. I remember standing in a shower with it so hot I could just barely stand there, and I would just stand there and cry. So, so scared. So I met God on the way up. I got to know him on the way down. You will learn some scriptures. I mean, you need to learn how to live because you don't know how to live. And so I had an I surrender all moment. And I'm not talking about a Baptist altar call where they keep playing until somebody finally surrenders so you can go to lunch, right? <laughs> I'm talking about I surrendered I surrendered. Jesus is not my co-pilot. He's the pilot. If he doesn't say do it, we don't do it. He is the Lord of my life. This is his love letter to me, and if it's in here and I can figure it out, I'm going to do it. And if it's in here and it says don't do it, I don't do it. It's a real simple thing for me. And the beauty of having gone broke is that is all I'm worried about. I love you, but I don't really care what you think. I'm not taking a poll. This is how we're doing it at the Ramsey's house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so I'm going to learn marriage. Well, thank you. That's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn marriage because I don't know how to be married. I'm a, I'm a doofus. It says in here, Submit yourselves one to another. Oh, crud. <laughs> means I got to dry dishes. <laughs> I have to serve my wife. <laughs> oh, brother, it'd be the other way. My kids are going through here. Dad, what's this rod stuff? <laughs> like, Come here, baby, I'll show you. <laughs> Some of you don't like that, but you're what's wrong with North America. So, <laughs> uh, There's 2,500 scriptures on how to handle money and possessions. Jesus talked more in the parables about money than in love and grace combined. Now, I understand typology, and I understand that sometimes those money stories were representations of other things in the spirit, but they're also money stories. The parable of the talents is a money story. The unfaithful steward is a money story. The, all of these are money stories. Jesus was telling, why is he so concerned about money? 
because it's our biggest idol. And he's not into us having idols. It's our biggest point of problem. And it reveals our heart as our treasure is. As our heart is, there goes our treasure. As your treasure is, there goes your heart. He's really concerned about your heart. It's got this connection to your wallet. And he wants to really own your life because he loves you. He's absolutely crazy about you. And we started living our lives this way and it started working. I'd like to tell you we bounced back, but we didn't. You ever done something stupid and blame everybody else? That's what I did. I blamed everybody else. It was the IRS's fault. It was the president's fault. And he had nothing to do with it, but it's always his fault. It was just me. You ever done something stupid and blame everybody else? Turns out McDonald's does serve hot coffee. <laughs> At some point in your spiritual walk, you decide if you're going to be a victim or a victor. Where are you going to be? At some point, you buy into this Jesus stuff at a different level. And so, you, know, you have to change. I got a bunch of young folks working on our team. We have 937 people on our team this week, and a whole bunch of them are millennials. And I love millennials, because there's only two kinds, awesome and sucks. <laughs> the awesome ones are so mission-driven, they will charge the gates of hell with a water pistol, man. They get after it. They get after it. And, the, and the, the other ones, they just live in their mother's basement and write a blog about stuff. You know, it's just, <laughs> right? So I got awesome ones on my team, man. And sometimes, though, we have to train them up and give them a little life lesson or whatever. But that's just, that's just leadership. We have to do that. You know, I came along with one of these young guys. He's doing the stuff he's supposed to be doing wrong. And I'm like, hey, don't do it that way. Look, this doesn't work. Here, do it this way. Here's why we do this, and here's how you should do it. Yes, sir. Okay, I come back a week later. He's doing it wrong again. I'm like, dude. Well, here's why we do this, and here's what we do. Do it this way. Yes, sir. I come back a week later, he's doing it wrong again. I'm like, buddy, we are going to set you free in Jesus' name, okay? <laughs> I sign your check. I said how to do this. I am not going to tell you again. And he looks at me and says, I'm not like you. And I said, you're right. I do it right. You do it wrong. <laughs> and what you should do right now is... Change. He said, what? And I said, you need to change and do it the right way. Isn't it interesting that God gives us the dignity of choice? We get to decide how we're going to live. You decide how you're going to do it. And when, if you're going along, if you've been going along like this, I've been going along doing stupid stuff, doing things wrong. And sometimes in the Bible, we would call that sin. And I'm going along walking the wrong way, and God says, hey, son, stop. Yes, sir. You need to change. Yes, sir. And I do a 180, and I start doing it the right way, and my life starts getting better. Not immediately always, but it always long term gets better. Walking in God, doing God's stuff, God's ways. When you're going the wrong direction, and you stop and decide as an act of your will to change. In Christianity, we call that repentance. You were walking in a wrong direction, you stop and go the other way. It can be simple stuff. It cannot be some evil moralistic thing. It could just be something simple in your life. But God is saying, there's a better way to do this. There's a better way to do this. And it's all in his love letter. It's all in his love letter. There's five things you can do with money that if you'll start doing these, they will start working immediately. Not because of Dave Ramsey, because it says in the Bible. And 100% of the time, you align yourself with scriptural truths, your life will get better over time. Five things you need to start doing with money. Number one, you need to do a budget. A written plan every month. Jesus said, don't build a tower without first counting the cost, lest you get halfway up and are unable to finish. And all who see you begin to mock you and say, this man began to build and was unable to finish. Don't live your life without a plan. Zig Ziglar used to say, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. My friend John Maxwell says, a budget is people telling their money what to do instead of wondering where it went. If you worked for a company called You Incorporated and your job at You Incorporated was to manage money for You Incorporated and you manage money for You Incorporated, the way you manage money for you now, would you fire you? Don't answer that. 
But God very clearly, right after the parable of talent, says, boys and girls, here's how it works. When you're faithful in the little things, then you will be given more to manage. Not, I'm disorganized, immature, and I just spend money like I'm in Congress, but I pray a lot about money. (laughs) It says, when I'm faithful in the little things, then. So my son, who's a wonderful young godly man now, is a leader on our team, he's a great guy. When he was a little guy, he's about 15 years old, getting ready to turn 16, he said, Daddy, when I turn 16, we're getting me a brand new Corvette. I said, well, I'm a loving father. No. I have seen you drive, my son. You are incompetent. If we put you in a fiberglass body with a 465 horsepower engine that'll go from zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds, you will kill yourself and someone else. I love you too much to give you what you think is a blessing, but because you can't handle it, it's a curse. You will be getting an old Chevette with a tired gerbil under the hood. And when you are faithful in the little things, my son, when you drive that car properly and it is kept clean and the oil is kept changed, we'll talk about moving you up. I modeled that after my heavenly father. When you're faithful in the little things, don't pray for money and then be misbehaving and irresponsible. God will answer your prayers. The answer is no. Because he loves you too much to give you something that you don't have the ability to handle and you thought it was a blessing and it would become a curse. You ever seen people that can't handle money get money and it destroys their life? I have a bunch of times. It's awful. The second thing is get out of debt. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. We get out of school. Sally Mae has her own bedroom at our house. We got a master card. We get a car payment. We buy a house we can't afford. We're spending money we don't have to buy stuff we don't even really need to impress people we don't even really like. And people get so far in debt they can't breathe. And they call me up and they're like, Dave, can you get me out of this? I'm like, yeah, it's going to hurt though. What do you mean? You're going to have to amputate the Tahoe. You're going to have to sell so much stuff the kids think they're next, man. (laughs) You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. You got to stop using debt and you got to get out of debt because your most powerful wealth building tool is your income. And when you give it all to someone else because you bought stuff you really couldn't afford, by the way, if you didn't pay for it, that means you couldn't afford it. Easy payments is an oxymoron. When you don't have any payments, got money. I've been through scriptures for 30 years looking at this and all the Dave Ramsey haters have tried to prove me wrong. No one has ever been able to give me a scripture out of all the people that hate me and disagree with me and all that don't like all my messages. Show me one scripture where God used money to bless or God used debt to bless his people. It's not in there. 100% of the scriptural mentions of debt are negative. In other words, biblically speaking, debt is stupid. It's not a sin. It's certainly not a salvation issue. It's just biblically dumb. It doesn't work. And your dad, who's smarter than you and is crazy about you, sent you a letter and told you that. You need to read his letter. It's not any harder than that. So we quit borrowing money at our house. You're kidding. No, I mean, we got out the credit cards and had a little candle ceremony and got the kids gathered around and decided we were going to have a plastectomy. Plastic surgery, American distress, Citibank, what's in your wallet? Money. (laughs) You're kidding me. Capital One. (laughs) You got to be kidding me. No. Dave, you don't get airline miles? Nope. I met with thousands of millionaires, never met a millionaire, said, Dave, you know, my financial breakthrough was those airline miles. (laughs) Never heard that once. And car payment will kill you. Average car payment in America right now is $526 over 84 months. I had a guy call me on the radio the other day from Texas. He's like, Dave, my truck's killing me. What do you mean your truck's killing you? 
How you owe on your truck? A lot. How much is your truck payment? $769. Like, dude, man, your thing's eating you alive. Yeah, man. I said, how much is your house payment? We live in a double wide, 550. Dude, if your truck payment's bigger than your house payment, you might be a redneck, okay? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, Dave, you don't have any credit cards? No, this is my wallet. Green president's faces. Four pieces of plastic. A debit card on my business. A debit card on my personal. My driver's license and my handgun carry permit. <laughs> Rednecks in Florida, huh? Yeah. Right. I said that in California the day I got arrested. But um, <laughs> it's good to be back in America. But um, <sighs> oh, I'm just kidding. We love you, people from California. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the third one is foster high quality relationships. You become who you hang around with. Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good hab good habits. Your speech patterns are like those you hang out with. The books you read are the, like the people you hang out with. The Bible studies you do or don't do are largely due to the people you run around with. The stuff you binge watch on Netflix is due to who you hang around with. You dress like who you hang around with. Your voice patterns and even the dialect within the region that you hang out in. If you hang out there long enough, your, your accent will change. If you hang out there long enough, you become who you hang around with. Over the next 10, 15 years, your income will be within 10 to 15% of the average of your 10 closest friends' income. Some of you are like, I need some new friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. You don't let your kids run around with a juvenile delinquent. Why? Because your kid would become a juvenile delinquent. Little Johnny down the street smoking weed. He's a weed head. You don't let your kid run around with little Johnny. Why? Your kid will be a weed head. You know that. It's not rocket science. Yeah. My daughter wants to date him, but he just got saved three weeks ago, and pretty much he was a dope dealer before that. It's like, eh, no. Huh? Dad, all the boys in the youth group are scared of you. Good. Good. It keeps away the jerks and the wimps. Two things you don't want to marry, baby girl. Yeah, you're kidding. You don't, you don't believe in the redemptive power of Jesus? Yeah, I just don't believe in Bobby. <laughs> Bobby's got to straighten up for a few months, and then I will look at the fruit in Bobby's life, and we'll re-talk re about this. But just because he got baptized again at summer camp doesn't mean we're going to believe in Bobby. I'm sorry. I do believe in the redemptive power of Jesus. I've seen it in my life, and I've also seen it in other people's lives, and also seen other people lie about it. So we'll just walk with this stuff. You, let, you hang around people that you want to become because you're going to be like them. The third one, or the fourth one is save money in the house of the wise or stores of choice food and oil. A foolish man devours all he has. If you spend everything you make, you're a fool. When you save money, you're wise, said Solomon, the wisest man ever to walk the earth. Grandma said it. She said save for a... Save for a... Visual aid. It's going to rain. There's going to be a car wreck. There's going to be a job loss. This one I don't understand. An unexpected pregnancy. Say what? Okay. <laughs> Stuff's going to happen in life, isn't it? And when you got some money and you're ready, and the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. And the last one is be outrageously generous because God loves a cheerful giver. And now, for those of us that are evangelical Christians, our baseline is tithing in our local church. I'm not talking about that. That's a good place to start. That's the rhythm of your life. That starts to build the character quality of generosity in your life. But I'm talking about generosity as a way of being, not just of giving money. A generous person actually in a conversation lets you talk. You ever meet those other ones? They never ask about you, but you know everything about them by the time we finish the conversation. You know what I'm talking about? 
Generous people don't do that. Generous people hold the door for you. Generous people pick up the items when the plastic bag had the bottom fall out of it as you're going to the or as you're going to the car after the grocery store. The generous person runs up and helps you. They're kind. They're generous. Generous people are highly attractive. Generous people have a higher tendency to win in their marriages. No kidding. Generous people have a higher tendency to be promoted and succeed in their careers because they just people love them. They're just lovable. And it's a decision. You get to decide to get out of debt, be on a plan so that you can save money and hang out with people that are doing the same kind of thing to put yourself in a position to be outrageously generous. You can't be outrageously generous when you're broke. You gotta clean up your mess and have a plan. When you decide, it changes everything. Generous people do wacky stuff with money. They have a different way of looking at things. Try this as an exercise. Easter or Thanksgiving, when you get ready to go to grandma's house on Sunday and have the big feast, put all the kids in the car and leave 30 minutes early so that you can do this. I want you to pull up in front of the window at Waffle House and park. And I want you to leave all the kids and family in the car and just tell the kids, look, it's like a TV screen, right? There's a window right there. Watch this. Go in, sit down at a chair or a table right in front of your car, and she'll come over and she'll pour you some coffee. I don't want you to stay long. You're on the way to Grandma's house. I sure don't want you to eat at Waffle House. You're on the way to Grandma's house, okay? But I do want you to get your cup of coffee. I want you to take three of these out. $100 $100 bills with Uncle Benjamin Franklin's face on the front. See notes, baby. Slip them under that saucer and slip out. Go sit down in the car. Hey, kids, put your screens down. Watch God show off. Look in here. Watch him. God's getting ready to show off. Here's what she'll do. I've seen her do it. She'll walk over and she'll pick it up. She's not sure it's real. It might be a trick. Because it's been so long since anything good has happened to her. Because you know who's working in Waffle House on Thanksgiving morning. Somebody needs a job bad. They need that overtime. You just paid, you just changed her net worth. Here's what she'll do. And even if she's not a person of faith, even if she prayed that morning or hasn't prayed in 20 years of mornings, 100% of the time, here's what she'll do. Because she can smell the breath of God. She knows what, human beings know what it smells like when they've encountered God. They can feel it, even if they're not walking with him right then. Generous people get the opportunity to breathe God on people. I dare you to have more fun with $300 than that. It doesn't get any better than that. That's about as much fun as you can have with 300 bucks. Put yourself in a position that you can do that as the rhythm of your life. And when your children are watching, you know what you'll raise? Little generous people. I've worked with folk like you guys for 30 years. I know you. You're my people. You're my friends. And people just like you are my best friends in the world. I'm proud of you. Your heavenly father's proud of you. But he said in some of your lives, it's time to change. There's some stuff you need to clean up starting right now because he loves you. He's got a plan for your life. It's not to bring you harm. It's to bring you hope. God, we thank you for these folks. I'm so proud of them. I know you're proud of them. God, we ask you to prosper them and to protect them, to bless them, Lord, to touch them. Father, to be with their families, to God, just cause them to walk in the exact ways that you have for them so that they receive real blessings that come only from you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for tuning in to Real Life Online. If you have any questions or are in need of prayer, we would love to connect with you. You can go to real.life slash connect and one of our amazing team members will reach out to you soon. Tuning in online when you're traveling or sick is a great way to stay connected. If this is your first experience with Real Life, we can't wait to welcome you at one of our campuses. You can find out more about our locations and service times by visiting us online at real.life slash locations. We would love for you to stay connected with our Real Life family by joining our new online Facebook group. You can join in on the conversation, ask for prayer, share exciting things God is doing in your life, and just connect with others in our online family. To join, go to the Real Life Christian Church Facebook page, then look for us under groups. We can't wait to meet you. And if you would like to stay up to date with what God is doing here at Real Life and always know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel now. You can also follow us on social media, download our app, or check us out online at real.life to stay plugged in. Once again, thank you for joining us today and remember that God's crazy about you.